Hi everyone, and we're back here at the Guidewell Insights Lounge on location at the Oliver Wyman Health Innovation Summit. Hi everyone, my name is Kate Warnock, and we have the guest we've been waiting for all day, Mr. Sam Glick. Sam, welcome. Kate, it's fun to be here again with you. You know, it's not the Health Innovation Summit without Sam Glick. It's not the, the Health Insight Innovation Lounge. Summit without Guidewell. Right? Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. So, all right. So, Sam, you have many titles, but the one that I've written down for you here is the director of the Oliver Wyman Health Innovation Center Leaders Alliance. Is that going well? It's going well. You know, yeah. we, um, from the outset, this is our fifth annual summit. Yeah. Um, the Innovation Center is actually six years old. And from the outset, it was a collaborative effort with industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we realized recently is there's 25 or 30 sort of executives in industry, including Renee Lehrer yeah. from, from uh, Guidewell, is, uh, who really help to drive the thinking. And so it's a, it's a fabulous group. We get together a couple of times a year, and they help to shape a lot of the thinking that you see here. You have such a list. I really encourage everyone to Google it. Just Google it. The list will pop up. And um, it's, it's really the people that are driving what's happening in the innovation space. So you've yeah. convened all the right people, in my opinion. All right. We're going to start with a little challenge, though, as far as your first question. Okay. You predict, Sam, that AI and machine learning will utterly disrupt the health industry in the not distant future. You've been writing a lot yep. recently, so people can look for that. Yet, is the precision medicine this technology enables possible when we still communicate by fax. How do we realistically get from here to there? So it's a great question yeah. and a good and a good challenge. You know, there's actually only two industries that still are the dominant users of fax machines. Healthcare and tow trucks. Tow believe it or not. Trucks. Uh, if you wow. call, if you call the auto club, odds are it's being dispatched by a fax to some single tow truck in a And if that doesn't tell somewhere. the story, what well, uh, does, right? Which I think says a lot about, it sure about healthcare. Um, I think the reason we're going to see AI and machine learning happen in healthcare, um, even maybe at the same time we're using fax machines, is that um, we're going to be forced to by the economics of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the biggest cost in healthcare is labor. Um, healthcare is a massively labor intensive business. It's 55 to 60% of the total costs in healthcare ultimately end up in payroll uh, one way or another. Um, it's the only industry where um, we have seen negative productivity. Um, for never productivity changes for quarter after quarter after quarter mm. after quarter, meaning we add people without adding corresponding output. Um, and six out of ten people who work in healthcare now are not patient facing, right? They're people who are doing coding and billing and processing and things that if you're a patient, you don't see as adding a lot of value. Sure. Um, and so, you know, are we going to see? Dr. Robot, right? You know, kind of the thing off the Jetsons that we all might remember. I think that's much farther out. But is there a meaningful role for automation that's going to take some of those six out of 10 and allow healthcare companies to reinvest in stuff that is patient facing, that is adding value, right? That's going to process claim claims with digital rules, that's going to help direct people to the right sites of care, uh, that's going to make sure everybody gets paid in the right ways and make sure we don't make medical mistakes. You know, that's the kind of thing that software is a lot better at than we are. And so we might have fax machines and have that on the back end just because that's where the economics direct us. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to pivot a little bit because you just got back from a really did. fascinating <laughs> conference and I was hoping you could share with us. Let's see. You participated in the first ever, it was called the Future Investment Initiative in Saudi Arabia and it convened global leaders to discuss path-breaking innovations, right? So that's why Sam Blake yep. is there, of course. How might what you learned about those financial innovations apply to, help, to the health sector? And give us more, you've made this comment or someone was commenting on your content. Give us more about building a new health ecosystem from the ground up. So, so Saudi Arabia is a fascinating place. I, I spend actually most of my days thinking about the U.S. health system, um, which is less than 5% of the world's population. Mm. And everyone around the world needs quality care. Um, and Saudi Arabia is in this really interesting place. 70% of the population of Saudi Arabia is age 27 or younger. Right? Wow. So it, hugely different than we are here. Right. right? And so their primary needs for health care today are babies and car accidents, right? It's maternity and trauma. Right. It's the kind of thing you get with a very young population. At the same time, they've had a culture that hasn't largely focused on health for a long time, for a whole mm -hmm. host of reasons. And so one out of five people in Saudi Arabia has diabetes, right? Oh, it's a, it's it? a huge, huge incidence of diabetes. And so they are wisely um, saying, you know, we're a very wealthy country. Right? We have all of this oil income that's changing, but they're very wealthy. We have a population that hasn't had 
significant health needs historically, but is going to have them. And we have this kind of chronic disease crisis crashing upon us. Uh, what do we do about it? And so, you know, they're asking the question, what lessons can we learn from U.S. healthcare about what to do and what not to do? Um, and I think, you know, to your question about sort of financing, one of the challenges they have is most of the healthcare investors in the world, most of the companies that are willing to bring capital and build things are U.S. companies, right? right? And they know U.S. modes of healthcare. They're U.S. insurance companies. They build U.S. style hospitals. And most countries need some of that, but nowhere near as much as what we have in the U.S. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what you need in a place like Saudi Arabia is to build a system from the ground up that is not based on fee-for-service, but it's based on value, right? The whole idea of a claim shouldn't exist, right? You could take that infrastructure out. That doesn't define healthcare as just what we do once you get sick, but incorporates all of the prevention and food and education mm -hmm. and, and all the housing and all of those things that we need. And then frankly, you know, Saudi Arabia is a vast expanse of land. Um, there's a lot of people, but they're concentrated in city centers. And then this huge rural population and the kinds of digital innovations that we're going to see here uh, at the summit are exactly the kind of thing you wouldn't want to make ancillary to the system. Right. You don't want to make them the core of the system, right? I shouldn't think of a doctor's office or a hospital as where I get most of my care. I should think of an app as where I get most of my right. care. And that's so much easier to do in a big distributed place than it is to build thousands of facilities. And sure. so, you know, they have a huge opportunity. They're at a fork in the road, which is they have the money to repeat the mistakes of the U.S., but they also have the money to do something really different from the ground up. And, and we were having uh, lots of conversations with them about what that might look like. Well, you know, I'm going to hone in on one comment that you just made as our final question for you. Yeah. You were talking about thinking of being a mobile first sort of health delivery system. Can you make a, there is a strong connection. I'm hoping you can kind of give us more insight between connected health and value-based care. Describe what that connection is. Yeah, it's a great question. So, um, you know, at the most simplistic, um, fee-for-service care says the more I do to you and the more complex it is, the more I get paid. And there's nothing inherently wrong or immoral about that. It's, in fact, how every other industry seems to work. Right. If I buy more valuable things at the store and more of them, the store makes more money in retail. If I put more money in the bank, the bank makes more money, mm -hmm. right? You can go all the way around. Um, the challenge in healthcare has been that unlike other industries, those high volume complex things are by their very nature more invasive, right? So the kinds of things that pay a lot in fee for service are the kinds of things that require a lot of manual technical skill, surgery, sure. procedures, infused drugs, right? And those don't lend themselves particularly well to connected health. It's not about behavior change. It's not about the stuff I do at home. It's not about the stuff I can do on my phone. And so when I switch to value, I take away that huge obstacle because I no longer worry about sort of proving that what I'm doing is complicated enough to get paid more for right. it. And I think that's really the connection, which is, um, you know, a lot of connected health, a lot of digital health is about getting people to change behaviors earlier or engage in healthy behaviors mm -hmm. earlier so that they don't incur those big expenses. Uh, and if I can do that and I can measure that and I actually get paid for that commensurate with my impact, then I'm really willing to innovate in that space. If I only get paid commensurate with the complexity of what I'm doing, I'm always going to be biased toward the physical stuff. Right. Right. So it really means coming back and aligning with the incentives that are there. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Right. All right. Well, Sam, it's always, always a pleasure to have you here in the Insights Lounge. So thank you for sharing your time with us. Delighted to be here. All right. We're happy to have you. This is Kate Warnock. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks, Kate.